Good evening, everyone. I'm Tim Westermeyer, the senior pastor here at St. Philip the Deacon. Uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to the start of the 15th uh, anniversary, or the 15th season of the Faith and Life lecture series. I am a pastor, not a mathematician, but I think that means that our speaker tonight is our 71st speaker in the series. So that's really exciting, and I'm glad you're here. Thank you for taking some time out of a beautiful fall evening to be with us. Um, it has become a practice uh, at the start of these. I, I'm kind of always curious how many of you have never been to a Faith in Life event before? Okay, so a special welcome to all of you. I'm glad you're here. Um, just a little background. So over the last 15 years, we have had people, the, the, most of them are lay people. We don't have theologians and preachers for the most part. So we've had people who are <clears throat> authors, who are doctors, who are lawyers. Uh, we had one politician. Um, <laughs> that's actually true. Uh, he was good. Um, and actually, we ha one thing we have not done a lot of is sports figures. We've had one sports figure in the history of uh, this series. It was Hillary Lunky who was a, the U.S. Uh, Women's uh, Open, uh, LPGA Women's Open champion. Um, and so tonight we're privileged to have our second athlete. Um, I think most of you probably know who he is, and I, these, these introductions are usually very brisk and very brief. I did have a chance to get to know him over the golf course this summer, and he can tell you about that if he wants. Um, <laughs> He, he grew up in South Dakota. He went to college in Iowa and was drafted, of course, by the Vikings. I always like to include one tidbit that you may not know about our speakers, um, and I asked him that tonight, and what he reminded me is that he is the, um, the reigning all-time record holder for the triple jump in the state of South Dakota. Is that accurate? <laughs> He, I asked him if he thought that record would hold forever. He said, probably not. Uh, but it is holding for now. We are so glad to have him here. Will you help me welcome Chad Greenway? Glad you're here. Thank you. Make sure my mic is on. Everybody can hear me? So. Happy to be here. Obviously for me it's really cool because I live in the area, um, have friends in the audience, and I get to speak to a lot of groups now, and a lot of companies, corporations, different things, and talk about leadership and teamwork and um, the drive and the, what it takes to become a pro athlete and all these things, and, and it's rare you get asked to speak, speak about your faith, your morals, your ethics, what makes you up. And so Tom Abrahamson, kind of gave me the initial invite, a neighbor, a friend of mine. And my response right away was, I've never spoken to church before, I'm not sure if I want to. <laughs> and to be quite honest with you, that's exactly what the email said, I think. And, and he kind of gave me the background and gave me some of the speakers and kind of told me what it was about and said it's, it's less about that and more about your story and what makes you up. And, and it's much more open than that. So I um, agreed to do it. And one of the confusing things for me was we're at the senior pastor at St. Philip the Deacon. I meet him at the golf course. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, this guy's going to be a hack. He's a pastor. He's no time. <laughs> There's no time. <laughs> when could the senior pastor not have time to go golf? He's like a six. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he played like a six that day. Then he's taking money off me. No, he didn't. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, got a chance to, it was actually a really great way to meet him because I got a chance to spend, you know, more than just um, a few minutes with him. got a chance to spend a, an afternoon with him, and that was really enjoyable and fun, and, and I got lots of tip, tips about my golf game, <laughs> um, which is good. I got some work to do on that one. And then the second thing I thought about when I said, I'm going to ask him to come and speak, I'm like, you know, I speak in front of a lot of groups, so I can't swear at this one. But they also can't judge me because we're in the house of God. So either way, like, we're good no matter what. So, so with all that being said, 
it's an honor to be here. I live about four miles from here down the road. My kids go to school at Gleason Lake. Um, I am on the president, or I'm on the board of the Wazetta Girls Basketball Association. Uh, I am trying to immerse myself in the community. I guess that's my politician now. I'm, I'm, I'm on a board, so that's, that's actually quite enjoyable. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I have my wife, Jennifer. We met in college. We've been married for 11 years. We have four daughters, uh, 10, 7, 3, and 10 months today. And uh, she walks already, so we have all sorts of problems in our hands. <laughs> but that's kind of the reason I bring that up on the front end is, is that's the reason and that's the perspective I have and that's the priority I hold dear is those four little girls and my wife. And before I go all the way back and start at the beginning, it helps you realize how I keep everything focused on that while being in one of the craziest businesses with all the bells and whistles and distractions you can have, all the sins all around you. If you just keep that at the center and think about that every day, we all have that family in some way. If we can just find a way to keep that center and make that the priority, we'll all be better off. So I grew up in South Dakota. And in South Dakota, love that place. Never met a bad person from there. And neither have you guys, I'm sure. But the thing about, I grew up in a town of about 400 people. Uh, I graduated with 26 kids in my class. Uh, my parents both went to that school. My grandparents went to that school. Um, I'm related to everybody you can imagine. And, but the fun part about growing up there is the environment. Everybody knows your business, negative, but everybody has your back. And when you grow up in that environment of everybody having your back and everybody looking out for you and what's your best interest, it's a pretty dang good place to grow up. And growing up, it was, you know, it was this, I grew up on a, on a pig farm. Uh, we had cows, pigs. We farmed about 2,000 acres. Uh, I grew up with my two older sisters. And that farm was everything to us. It was our lifeblood. It was, we put every dollar back into it. We didn't have a lot of money because every dollar went back into that farm. And that, that appreciation of hard work and appreciation of my parents going out and, and working every day diligently for something that may not happen, which is the farmer's world, um, was a great lesson. Because sometimes your goals and sometimes the things you're reaching for are out there and they just may be what ifs but it's still up to you to go out there and work hard every day to make sure you're going to put your best foot forward to give yourself the best chance. Much like what ends up being my football career. But going, kind of circling back, my, my childhood was incredible. The nearest neighbor was two miles away, lived about six miles from town. A little boy, you could do whatever you wanted. <laughs> Had a lot of guns, got a lot, do a lot of fun stuff. And that freedom was really good for me, but as I grew older, I got a lot of responsibility. And the farm gave me a responsibility with leadership, with teamwork, being a part of something bigger than yourself, and having an obligation to come home from school and get your butt to work until the sun goes down. The only time I didn't like, which is weird for a kid that goes to school, is summer. Because you could not hide from mom and dad in the summer. <laughs> and the sun stayed up so long. <laughs> and the reality was is my dad did not come in from work until the sun was down. That was just the way it was. And you learn a lot on those days working with your dad. And you learn to appreciate what makes him up. And you learn to appreciate the relationship and bond he had with my mother. And you learn to appreciate the, their bonds with their parents and how important those relationships are, not only to them, but then to us kids. And for us kids now have kids. And it's our job and obligation to pass it to them. So the story really comes back to parenting and having to be the ultimate obligation, which most of us in here, I'm sure, are parents or are going to be parents someday. And when I started to grow up and get better at sports, and I had this goal, this dream, to become a, a professional athlete. I mean, I told my dad, I, and my parents knew from a young age, I did not want to farm. I was like, how could you work that hard, that long, for nothing? It just did not make sense to me. So I'm the kid, much like these kids sitting here today with jerseys on. I was that kid watching TV. You know, I was Max Litke, my neighbor boy who loves football and loves sports, and who looks up to a professional athlete. And I watched TV, and I watched ESPN, and I watched all these, all these guys playing, and I, and I thought, okay, I learned, you kind of learn how to act, you learn their manners, and you try to become them as players. 
And of course, you don't gain perspective on how important that is until you get older. And then when I became a professional athlete, and then I realized what type of example I have to be because I was that kid watching those guys. And as I grew up in my small town, it was funny because I was doing things in our area that really had not never been done before. We won state football championships. Um, I just got announced I'm going to go into the South Dakota Basketball Hall of Fame next spring. Um, I had multiple state track meet records. But from our small town, it just didn't happen. So it became sort of this big story in our state, you know, our state of 700,000 people, whatever South Dakota has these days. And when you become a big deal, it was so nice because, and this is something I'll, I'll reach back to often in this talk, is when you become a big deal in a small town, right? There's a song, Country Song, everybody's famous in a small town, right? Because no matter how big of a deal I got, college, pros, high school, it didn't matter. Because you were just Chad who went to the Salem Lutheran Church, who probably got A's and B's in school, got in a little bit of trouble, but everybody had your back. And the reality was, is if you did something wrong in library, in library she was going to call your mom that night. <laughs> and that was the, the beauty of living in a small town. And so I get older, and, and I get to where I'm starting to get some colleges that are looking at me, and, and, and I'm, that dream of playing professional sports becomes a little bit closer. Now, I played nine-man football in high school, and we played five-man basketball, though. Um, <laughs> but, we, but we, I'm glad you guys got that one. You guys are sharp. Um, so you imagine the audacity of a kid who grew up with 400 people in this town, graduated with 26 kids, I dated all 12 girls, and, <laughs> and you, and you the, uh, and played nine-man football, and you realize, like, this guy's going to go play professional sports, and I didn't, nobody was going to tell me different, and the funny thing about my parents were, my parents didn't go to college, my parents, well, this is actually a funny story you guys will also appreciate. So my parents get married right when they turned 18, October. They had my sister in February. It took us like, till we were teenagers to figure out that math didn't work out. <laughs> South Dakota math. But hey, it was the 70s, that's what they say. So, so but just kind of, I bring that up because I, it, their lives were built around each other and their farm, and their family, and, our, and us kids. I was the youngest. They had me at 24. And they struggled for years to put food on the table and to make ends meet and to make that farm go through the farm crisis of the early 80s and keep chugging along. And I look back now all these years and just am so proud of my parents for the things they went through for us, but more importantly for the examples they gave us of how to live and work with each other, how to fight and love things we all do, things my wife and I do all the time. And um, I, I'll forever be grateful for those guys for that. But the biggest thing I'll give them credit for was coming from two people that have a high school degree, got married right out of high, sc right out of high school, had kids right away, moved two miles from my grandparents' house. They let us dream as kids. They let us think those big picture things could really happen. My mom wasn't saying, well, no, you not, you can't do that. If you're from Mount Vernon, there's 400 people in this town. Nobody comes from us. Nobody comes from here and makes it. It wasn't about that. They gave me every possible tool to go be successful. And the thing they gave me that ended up being my weapon of choice through my whole career was a strong mind and a work ethic. Because everybody I ever came up against that was better than me, faster than me, stronger than me, they could never outwork me and they couldn't do it every day. That's something a lot of people think about it or forget about is, it's one thing for you to be better than me on day one, day two, day three, but how long can you maintain that? Because I'm coming every day. And that's how my parents thought. They were out there grinding on the farm every day with no outcome in the immediate future. But it didn't matter. They kept turning the wheel. So I'd be remiss if I came into church and spoke and didn't talk about our faith and our family and how that served us. And so growing up, my parents, we went to the Salem Lutheran Church, like I mentioned. It was, we went every week. My parents went, they dropped us off half the time. They had work to do, of course. The farm never stops. And I often, as a kid, asked my parents, you know, like, why do we go all the time and you guys go half the time? 
you know, because I thought it was, you know, job, you know. And they say it's, life is really more about what you put out, what you give to your community, how you interact with your neighbors, how you live your life, to live by an example, and less about being the person sitting in the front pew of the church, but living the wrong way the other six days. And I didn't think that was fair, because I still had to go sit to the hour and a half church service, but <laughs> the thing you think about is, is, is now, like, you know, I'll be honest, I don't make church every Sunday. There's times I miss. There's times our family misses because of schedule. Sometimes we pick sporting events over church. Is that right? Probably not. We'll find out someday. <laughs> but the thing about it is, is that in reality, how we treat each other was always more important to my family and my parents than being that visual person that always had to be the front row of the church. Now, you can have it both ways. You can be that person and be a great person. Just don't be the person that's sitting in the second pew and judging everybody all week. And there's a lot of truth to that. I think we all can agree to that. And in a small town like that, like I said, everybody knows everybody's business. So out there, everybody's farmers. And there's a really good example that my dad gave me of, of a family who was really important in the Catholic Church and they gave a lot of their money and they were really, they were really um, upfront about their religion. And, but when it came to a business deal and it came to swindling land from the neighbor who had farmed it for 20 years, they'd undercut, make a higher bid, and take the land. One example of thousands we can all think of of people around us that put on a good face, but in reality aren't that person. They're willing to do whatever it would take to get the advantage over somebody else. And, you know, you don't have that perspective as a kid. But now as an adult, when I have kids and I'm... And I'm watching my kids interact with other kids, and I'm watching my kids interact with adults, you know, I'm constantly monitoring how they're treating people. And I'm constantly monitoring how they're treating kids that are less fortunate than them, or kids that have a handicap, or kids that are just different. And I think in this day and age, especially in sports, with the anthem and, and um, you know, how African Americans are being treated in, in this country, it's never more needed now than to have kids with some empathy towards everybody. And... You grew up with that. And I grew up with this example right in my own home all the time. So a big part of my professional career has been our family foundation, the Lead the Way Foundation. Some of you may have heard of it. I know there's people here who have been a part of our events and have, have helped us raise money. And we've helped countless number of families and kids and, um, you know, kids and families that shouldn't have to go through a lot of things they're going through. And we just try to make as big of an impact as we can. You know, long after they, start, you know, they stop counting my tackles, people, we hope, will remember our, the legacy our foundation has left. And hopefully that imprint is bigger than our football foundation has left. And so I get this example. You know, I get this big platform in the NFL. It's, it's nice, right? You have all these people. You can have these people with a lot of, you know, big checkbooks come to your events. You can fund things, and you can use that money for good. Well, growing up, we went through our church, and my parents didn't have a lot of money, but we had meat. We had livestock. We had as many cows out there you could eat. And pigs. So what we do every year is we would take, take a, one pig, one cow, we'd go butcher, and we'd take it to our church, and we would use that meat to make sure that every family that needed it in our community and surrounding communities had a good meal for the holidays. Now, is that like groundbreaking? No. I mean, there's a lot of people that do a lot of good, but it's an example. One example of many that my parents gave to me that always has stayed with me. And the best part for us as kids was we were so excited because we got to go in the car and go around and help drop off the meat. And to see the look on, their, on the family's faces and the kids' faces knowing that they probably weren't going to get a great meal and now all of a sudden they were going to. Like as happy as they were, the feeling we had was twice as good. And like I said, it's coming from a family who, yes, we had things, but we didn't have everything in which we were totally fine with. But to see the look on those families' faces and the kids' face was something you'll never forget. So that's kind of the foundation that was set for me. So now it's 2001, I'm going to go to college. I get offered a scholarship at the University of Iowa. I had one scholarship offer, so my decision-making skills were pretty easy. <laughs> I just went. Um, but it was funny because I had told you earlier my dream from as a kid, you know, five or six years old, is I want to play professional sports. That's my dream. That's what I want to do. Nobody could tell me anything different. 
And then I get a scholarship off to go to Iowa, and I was scared to death. You know, a lot of us don't talk about fear, especially men, you know, we have a problem talking about stuff like that. But the reality was I was scared to death to go because I was scared to be the guy that failed. There was one person that got a scholarship off to play Division I football that year in the state of South Dakota, and it was me. Now, can you imagine having, you know, a year later come back and say, hey, can I come back and play here at the state school, which would have been a great place. But, hey, can I come back and play? And then the news is, you know, Greenway comes back home. He can't hack it, basically. You know, what the headlines, what's the headline going to be? And that's all I could think about in my head was that failure. So it's funny to have that dream. It's all you want in your whole life. And then you have this fear of failure where can I push through that or not? And so many times in life, right, we're all kind of in the crosshairs of those opportunities. We're all looking at them and saying, okay, can I get out of my comfort zone and get this done? What, it's, what am I going to use when I go there? My, and my, so I go there. I'm a two-star recruit. Nobody knew who I was. I was the underdog. And in life, it's always easy to be the underdog. Nobody has any expectations. You get to come there kind of under the radar and just go to work. And for me, that place and that university could not have been a better fit. Because it did not matter once you got on campus and the recruiting was all done. They got telling everybody how great they were. They stopped doing that. And you went on the field and you went to workouts. It just simply was, how good are you? And the reality was, is kind of going circle back to my story was, and how good are you every day? And can you maintain that? So I go in, there's a 200 pound quarterback, and I say this joke every time I say a speech, I still think I'm a great quarterback. <laughs> and I've been texting Zimmer all week, I heard Sam's knee's not feeling well. Um, but. So I go there as a quarterback, in my mind, I was thinking I'm going to play quarterback, you know, that's it. I go there and they move me to safety within, literally within like 10 minutes of the first practice. <laughs> like, well, you should probably go play defense. I'm like, oh, all right. About three months later, I had never lifted weights before. So I went there, as like, like I said, 200 pounds. I never lifted weights in high school. It was always, you go back to the farm. I'm not going to throw as many hay bales as you wanted all day. But I'm not, I would never lift it. So all of a sudden, I started lifting weights. And got on, you know, got on, got some protein in my body. Gained, started gaining some weight, started getting some muscle. Now I'm 210, 215 pounds, and they say, hey, what do you think about moving to linebacker? Now I was a quarterback in high school, and you say, you're going to move me to linebacker. Now it's like, okay, you know, things are going downhill here. <laughs> Pretty soon I'll be playing D-line. <laughs> and, but the thing is, in my mind, I mean, I, I joke about that now, but in my mind, I was like, I'll do whatever it takes. It doesn't matter. I'll run through the wall. Whatever you need to get done, I'm going to do it. I'll be there for you. I'll be there for the team. I just want to play. I want to have a chance. So I moved to linebacker. I'm in my redshirt year. I literally go from the third team to getting first team reps my first spring at Iowa. You know, I go from this, this mindset of I'm scared to go. I go there. I make a difference. I make an impact. Now I have a chance to actually play as, my, as a freshman. And spring game, I tear my ACL. And that mind, you know, that just crushes you crushes you. And it crushes you so much more mentally than it does physically. The physical part is hard. The physical part you can work on every day. The physical part is there. You can see it. And you can see yourself getting better. But mentally, like, can you get over that crunch of like, and some of you probably are in a crunch right now. You're probably in a low spot. It's like, I got to get up every day and just attack it over and over. And pretty soon you can get back on top of that hill and that feeling you're going to have of saying, hey, I climbed that hill back again. And that feeling is going to be totally worth it. Because when I did that, and you attack it every day, and pretty soon you start making some ground, you get some confidence, and all of a sudden you can start moving again. And as an athlete, that's huge. Yeah, I'm going to become myself again. Just better, hopefully. Hopefully they put something like, you know, tighten something a little extra, a little faster. And I come back, and I get a chance to play a couple games that freshman year. It happened in May. I got to play like October through December. Um, we won the Big Ten. We went to the Orange Bowl. It was an awesome season. Come back the next year. I win the starting spot. You know, I was a two-time All-American, three-time All-Big Ten. And it just was one of those things where I made the right move to linebacker. And I had a lot of fun. And the best part about Iowa was, hands down, is if anybody's familiar with our program, we've had the same coach since 1998, Kirk Ferentz. And, you know, we don't always win 10, 11, 12 games. We go six win seasons, seven win seasons, eight win seasons. We always try to beat the Gophers. Um, <laughs> but the thing about him is, is and that program, is that program was that same bubble I had in my community where I grew up, based around morals and ethics and making the right decisions and treating people right. That program was that same environment. 
So not only could I grow there and grow as an as a athlete and become the player that I was meant to be, fulfill my potential, but I could maintain my course, right? Cows, there's so many evils that just attack you all the time. And the single greatest thing that happened to me was I met my wife freshman year. And that, I think want, maybe is the best word, or, or need to maintain that relationship through all that, the stuff that's going around you in college, to maintain the correct thought process of what's going on, all these things going on around you. And don't forget, I do like to have fun. I'm not standing up here claiming to be a saint. But the reality was, when it came down to that point, and we've all been there, where we have that decision of, am I going to go down this path or this path? When you're at that moment, I've always had so many good people that I was raised by, that I went to college with, that I was around, that always kind of came to mind, helped me think, I need to go down this right path. And we've all been in those crosshairs before. And we've seen athletes, we've seen people that you're around in the community go down that wrong path. And, and I say this to my kids almost every day, you are who you hang around. You become the people that you spend the most time with. My parents, I spent a lot of time with them as a kid. They're great people. My parent, grandparents are great people. Just, I couldn't help it but be good by their lesson. I get in an environment at Iowa, great football coach, really more of a producer of men than NFL talent. He does both pretty well. But he, he holds you to a higher standard. And if you're not upholding that standard, he is not willing to, to make the program suffer for an individual. They make you separate the ego from the team. Right when you come in, they set the tone with that. And now are you willing as an athlete to put that side, the individual part aside and say, hey, you know what, I want to play in the NFL. I want to be an All-American. I want to be all these things. But are you willing to put that aside for what the real goal is here? To be part of something bigger than yourself. And a lot of us answered the bell and said, yes, we do. And if you do things this way over time and you can do it every day, those dreams, if you're good enough, will be there. So... I get drafted in 2006 in the first round, dream achieved. One of the best days of my life. You know, to have that moment, I was back in the family farm in South Dakota, all my friends, college friends, high school friends around me, and to have that moment of like this achievement, this feeling of just fulfillment, of like I made it, was just incredible. And the best part was that you're celebrating with the people that helped get you there. You know, you think, you know, you're, I made all the tackles, I'm the guy. Well, the reality was it took an army, right? It takes a village to raise somebody like that and to kind of put them in the right environment, to have the right people around, and a little bit of luck to get to that point. And I'm sitting there, and then you realize pretty quickly, though, when you get in the NFL world, that things are going to be different. Because now there's not that pretty little bubble that protects you. It's complete chaos, and everybody wants to see you fail. That's the biggest thing about the NFL is everybody wants to see you fail, except the, the circle that's around you that wants to see you do well. Your family, your friends, the people that are close to you. But everybody's writing a newspaper article wants to see you fail because that's a better story. You know, everybody wants to write the story that somebody's a bust. And so when I come in, I went from being that underdog to being, the, you know, in a sense, the guy that everybody expected something of. So I'm like, okay, so do I need to do something different? So I go to training camp. First year training camp, and probably some of you guys fans know the story, I tear my other ACL. So I have them both now. It's like, what's going on? Family, bad genetics. And again, the injury becomes my best weapon. It's one of those things where you get put in a tough spot and you just let it become a positive. So for me... Doesn't happen very often. You get a red shirt year in the NFL. As a first round pick, you get a little more rope. You get a little, you get a little bit more of a, a leeway to kind of fail or screw up. This year, I had a whole year off, right? To get to learn and watch people. And I think when we walk around in life, in my case, football or in business or whatever walk of life you're in, it's like if you can just take something every day from somebody else who you know does things the right way, you're always just growing and getting better. In our business, everybody's always trying to take your job. They're always trying to pay you less. They always want to find a reason to try to get rid of you. But the reality is, is if you can constantly stay ahead of it, you have a chance. 
And if you can constantly put the things aside and say, I'm, you know, I'm in my seventh year in the NFL, I got everything figured out. No, that can't be the mentality. The mentality is I got to learn something new every day. So I took that approach. I get back from the injury, I come back 2007, I start, and I play 120 some games in a row, like eight years in a row of football. And year five, I'm in Rick Spielman's office, our GM. And I have this new contract sitting on the table, more money than you ever thought you would have made. And the crazy part is what he said to me. He's the GM of the team. He is paid to put people on the team to help him win games. He said, this contract is less about your performance on the field, more about the person you are. Those are his words. He would tell you the same thing today if he was standing up here. And it became more about what do you do in the community, your foundation, the work you do. And these aren't things that I'm doing that for that reason. It just becomes that people realize that that ends up being more of a priority than what you can actually do on the field. Now, you have to play. You have to do well. What are you doing in the locker room? What kind of example are you setting? You know, in the NFL and in, in a lot of our worlds, we come across people that are going through some tough things, come from challenging places. You know, I had so many teammates came from single, you know, single parent households. You know, they would sit down with me and have a conversation with me about how I grew up. And then I realized how big of an advantage I had over a lot of people simply because I had a male influence in my life. And a really positive one. And that those moments of leadership or captainship, whatever you want to call them, um, with your teammates, you know, there's, there's trickle down and there's, and there's, in this case, trickle up to the upper management saying, this guy is more valuable than just making tackles. This guy is valuable in other ways. And it wasn't because I was just, you know, I'm the best jokester in the locker room. The reality was, is I came in in 2006. Who remembers what happened in 2005? Lake Minnetonka. Boat scandal, right? Now, how did, that, how did that make all you guys feel, you Viking fans? Probably not real sweet, right? So I got brought in, essentially. I was the, next, I was the first pick of our new ownership, the Wilfs. I was the first pick of Coach Childress, the new coach. And I was the first pick after that debacle. And you don't realize that then. You're, just, you're so excited to get drafted, and you just can't wait to go to Minnesota. Da, da, da. But then you realize, you're like, you know what? I got brought here for more reasons than just football. And then you realize that foundation that was set in Mount Vernon by my parents, by my church, by my community, of just making the right decision. Living the right way can literally help you get your dream in even a world like the, I think the NFL. Now, who would have thought you know, when I was a kid, that that would play a part in that. But it 100% did. And it played a part in me playing all 11 years in one place. So the lesson here really is, yes, it's about faith and family, certainly. About making the right decision. Treat your neighbor appropriately. Live with a set of morals and ethics that you have to set every day. And then challenge yourself, and sometimes fail, to live up to them all the time. And when you do fail, pick yourself back up and do it again and set your standards higher. And through all this, I told you I met my wife in 2001 or two, whatever it was. And I should know that. Um, <laughs> 2001. <laughs> She's not here. She's going to get back to her now. I've got friends in the audience. <laughs> November 21st, 2001. How was that? <laughs> and... When you, I met her, I was just like, you know, of course, I was a college kid. I was just in awe, in love. I was a jersey chaser. She ran track. And um, she was fast. It took me a while to chase her, to catch her, rather. And um, as we, we dated, she, I knew this was the moment. I better pop the question because she was a very talented accountant. She was, she, before um, she started having, we started having kids, and she had this really great internship at Deloitte & Touche in Chicago, her dream job. She's from Chicago. She wanted to go to Chicago. That was like her dream. This was going into her senior year of college. She turns it down to stay there for the summer with me. And I'm like, yep, this is the moment. We've been dating for three, whatever it was, three or a half years. And I'm like, this has to be the moment. So I pop the question. We get engaged. We get married. The same year I get hurt, my first year in Minnesota, 
We decided to have our first child. So that was another positive from the injury. And since that moment, you know, the NFL is a, it's a really great place if you make it a great place. Back to that decision. But it can be a really, really bad place. If you ever put yourself in a position where you go out without your wife or you do, you know, there's always people that want to be around you, right? They want, and, and I've seen this with teammates. You know, I came into the NFL with a wife, had a family. I had that circle that I could look at and say, this is my priority all the time. That's how I started the speech, right? That's the priority. If you always keep it there at the center, you'll always be okay. But I've, I've had a lot of teammates who come in with just themselves and nothing else. And that's just not enough. Because then you're always out there constantly looking for what's next, what's better, what's best. And then pretty soon you don't realize that now your career is failing and you don't have those other pillars in your life that can really hold you up and say, hey, this is what you're meant to do. It's just what you do, it's not who you are. So really the key to my success over everything is my family, without question. My children, my wife. And as I went through the NFL, you know, year four, we have Beckett, who's now our seven-year-old, and it just becomes even stronger. And the fact that I have girls, everybody always, hey, when are you going to have that boy? You know? Well, first of all, I had two older sisters, so I, I know what, how everything works. <laughs> and, and the other thing is, there's nothing better for me than to be able to provide that example to my daughters of how to treat their mother. And how they're going to be expected to be treated. And I just look at that as such a challenge. Um, we have our hands full with these four, I'll tell you that much. Um, they're great athletes, so hopefully get college paid for at least, because girls are expensive, I've heard. <laughs> Man, a lot, I'm not sure I'm going to afford it. But um, needless to say, you know, those four and my wife are my life now. And throughout the 11 years I played in the NFL, they, I always kept them centered. And I'll leave you with this before I get pulled off the stage. I'm not even sure where I'm at time-wise, but hopefully I'm good. But um, the biggest thing I can challenge everybody in this room to do is over and above what you've done, what you have, what your resources are, if it's money, if it's time, the biggest thing I can challenge you guys to do is to find something, if you aren't already, I'm sure most of you are, to give back something. Just give something. It can be a mentorship program. It can be your time. It can be, you know, sending food somewhere and packing food. It can be feed your starving children. It can be start a family, found, family foundation. It can be go to a foundation event of some place where you know they're doing good and making a difference in some way. And just say, here, what do I have? Here's what I can give. And people always get caught up in the giving's got to be about money. And I can tell you the foundation we started, we started with the idea of like, well, what do we want to do? I don't know. What's, what should be our focus? Well, we had our first kid. We should make it about kids. So we started with, we want to help kids that have cancer. And then we said, we want to provide these kids and families to get sick. We want to provide all this. We have these big lockers now we put in these hospitals. We're, we're going to do our ninth this fall. And we can put that one in Iowa City. And these lockers are filled with technology. iPads, you know, digital cameras, Nintendo DSs, Xbox, laptops. And all these parents, kids, can watch whatever they want. They can go check it out like a library system and say, hey, we're going to use it during the time of our stay. We, the best story is we had a, a kid watch every episode of Family Guy on the iPad. <laughs> the mom was like, thank you? <laughs> no question mark. But, you know, we've heard so many stories of, from families of just, we just needed something. And the idea with the digital camera was not everything in a hospital happens is bad. And we have our Tender Heart Luncheon we do with our foundation. And the Tender Heart Luncheon is only moms of these kids. Only moms that have lost kids, that have sick kids, that know somebody with a sick kid. Basically, somebody is going some, through something that just shouldn't be. And every person we meet, they're getting, now they're getting divorced. They've been left on their own. It's been six years. They don't know my child's disease, you know, the primary cause. They have 30 other diseases that have been on the primary. You start realizing really quickly how fortunate you are when you start getting out there and meeting people that are less fortunate than you. And 
the ability to give those women, those women a morning where we can pamper them and, and, and uh, let them talk to each other is invaluable for them and it's invaluable for the funds that we're raising at our foundation. But the, the best part about that event is there's a microphone right here on the stage and we give it open, it's like open mic. And these women get up and tell these stories that are just impossible. You just can't believe the things they've gone through. And all of a sudden, and, I, and I'm not going to stand there and say, yeah, I know what you're going through, because we know, I mean, it's not true. But everybody in the room does, because they've all been there before. And they're never in rooms where people get it. We all think we do. But until you go through it, you don't. So they're more appreciative of that than the jewelry we got them or something, the gifts we were able to give them. They're more appreciative of just that feeling of being part of a community that gets it. So I challenge you just to do that, to give back. Become some, part of something you know, that's bigger than yourself. If you do that, the fulfillment you get out of that is just incredible. And that's one of the biggest things that we want to pass on to our children, is do something like that with the resources that you have. And we didn't realize the impact. So 2012, my dad gets leukemia. And my dad is told in the story is one of my favorite people on this earth, the favorite person. The best example you could have as a, as a male, I mean, just did everything the right way, worked hard uh, for everything he ever got. Treat everybody how they should be treated. In our small town, we had a church that was much smaller than this, and the wake line is, you know, out around the block of just people that came to show their respect to my father. The ultimate sign of respect. And to watch him go through two years, battle two years, you know, through leukemia, the ups and downs, the struggles, the heartache, the two stem cell transplants, I mean, just the ungodly things you had to see and he had to go through. It was one of those stories where you can, you know, some of you, you might not believe me when I say this, but the guy just never complained. You know, I'd be jumping in the car and I remember, you know, we'd have a game on Sunday and I would sleep, you know, at the hospital Friday night, come back for Saturday, walk through to go play on Sunday, and now I'm complaining to my wife, I'm tired of this and that. He just never complained. He's the one sitting there dealing with it. I always worry about my, my mother. You know, just to watch a guy go through that and to watch him handle that when you already appreciate how great he is, to just be able to appreciate him more, it's just incredible. It's like meeting your hero for the first time and him being everything you thought he was. And, uh, and now I don't get to talk to him anymore. I miss that a lot. And um, I just think, I always think, you know, what would he do? What would he say? And now, of course, it's my challenge to live up to what he created and to become that dad and that example that he was. So really, like I said before, this is really talk about parenting. And what more can we do to impact our children so that when they get up and they're raised, they're making the same or bigger impact than you did. So thank you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Uh, we are going to have a chance to ask uh, Chad some questions. Thank you, Chad, for a beautiful talk. Um, I'll let him rest his voice for just a couple minutes while I make a couple of announcements. And while I'm doing this, if you have questions you're thinking about asking him, we have a mic here and a mic here. Uh, you can come up in a couple minutes and we'll, we'll do Q&A for not as long as you want, but uh, for a while. <clears throat> but let me lift up a couple things. The, uh, the next event um, is October 26th that will feature a gentleman named Ian Cron. I don't believe he holds the record for the triple jump, um, <laughs> but he's going to be awesome too. So uh, you can learn more about him uh, on our website. Uh, he's an expert in something called the Enneagram and has written a lot about uh, becoming who God made you to be. So I hope you'll join us for that uh, again the 26th of October here at St. Philip the Deacon. Um, if uh, we have a lot of new people here tonight, if you would like us to proactively alert you to future events, if you look in your bulletin program, whatever you want to call this thing, in the middle panel on the bottom, <clears throat> 
uh, if you can either like us on Facebook, uh, you can also at our website, uh, faith-and-life.org, you can sign up for periodic emails. We don't send a ton of emails out, but we send a couple out uh, to remind you of upcoming events, so please sign up for those. Above uh, that uh, thing on the bottom of the middle panel, you'll see a bunch of names, and also on the right panel, a bunch of names. You'll see some companies listed. Again, I mentioned this is the 15th uh, year of the Faith and Life series. From the beginning, it has been supported 100% through the generosity of members our, of our community, both individuals and corporations. You see um, the corporations, I'll mention some of them, Productivity Inc., a Plymouth-based company, Cressa, uh, Honeybee Capital, which is actually, uh, it's actually Honeybee Capital Foundation now. That's run by a former speaker at Faith and Life who was so taken by what we were doing here that she now supports it financially. Uh, Anselm House, which is a Christian study center at the University of Minnesota, Rapid Packaging, Mally Design, Sparky Abrasives, Thrivent Financial, uh, Community Crossroads, Motive Action, and Mastercraft Labels. And then a whole lot of individuals, again, listed there, some of them anonymous. Um, you are here tonight, free of charge, at no cost, thanks to the generosity of these amazing people, many of whom are here tonight. Also, would you help me thank them for making this possible? <laughs> Um, I, I don't mean to walk you through this whole program thing, but on the back, or this, this panel here, which is tear off, um, one of the questions we get most often is, where do you come up with ideas for your speakers? And the truth is, a lot of them, after 15 years, come from suggestions from people like you. So I would encourage you, if you have ideas for future speakers, we're always interested in trying to figure out who will make a good speaker here. Please um, <clears throat> drop this in the uh, basket out in the narthex or send an email to info at faithandlife.org. Um, I also do want to say on that front a thank you to the individual. This isn't always true, but in some instances there is a single individual who really makes uh, a particular event possible. Chad already mentioned him, but Tom, Tom, where are you? There. Tom was a former neighbor of Chad's. Chad's moved away. I think you've got the whole block here, maybe. <laughs> but Tom, Tom really was instrumental in brokering the uh, connection that made tonight possible. So Tom, thank you very much. Would you thank Tom for making this possible? And I do always like to thank Jeff. Jeff Elstad over there has been, he's our musician. He played for you when you got here. He'll play again when you leave. Thank you, Jeff. And, um, I think that's all I was supposed to say. Uh, if it wasn't, I'll say more later. But uh, if there are questions again, Chad, if you want to come back up and take a few questions again, a uh, mic there and a mic there, and we'll take questions for a little bit now. No hard ones. <laughs> Somebody's got to be first, though. I'll start calling people out. <laughs> Chad, I'll be first. Uh, great talk, great speech. Uh, Thank you. It's more guys like you that come out of NFL like you. We wouldn't be reading what we're reading today. Um, two things. Number one, I have a hunch that Chad Greenwood would not be a kneeler, number one. Number two, uh, a couple of years ago, I saw the movie Concussion. I come out of that thing, uh, Chad, I was really, really disappointed with the NFL. And not so much the players, it's management. Uh, I didn't even know about commission thing. Thirty-four million bucks are paying this guy, the owners, and it's denied, 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 denied until it's kind of come to the forefront. A lot of your friends you played against that you know the Vikings have had a hard time with, you know, this brain brain issues. Mm -hmm. What your thoughts and what you think the NFL can do better because the ratings are down, people are getting turned off, uh, management's making a lot of money. What can they do to improve the game? Thank you. Uh, is this being taped? Can I say it? <laughs> um, so 2006, when you come into the NFL, um, you know, talk about concussions was minimal. It was like, you know, I knew there was obviously a risk. I think you always knew there was a risk of injury. You know, the only thing guaranteed in the NFL is injury. You know, it's 100% guarantee you'll be injured. And um, 
so it was like 2007, 8, 9, in that range. I can't even pinpoint when it was, when all of a sudden it became like a really big deal. And then you start thinking about, yeah, that's probably not good for my brain, huh? And at that moment, you know, I could have said, you know what, this, this, isn't, this isn't what I want. I should be done with this. You know, I have kids, and the risk is real. And as we kind of kick the can further down the road, it's become more real. Um, I'll say that I've benefited from better technology, uh, less impacts. Um, we can't hit as much in practice. I think the one thing they could do in the NFL is take away all, and we actually just talked about this downstairs, was take away all practice impact um, during the season. You know, because the biggest thing is, is that constant impact on the brain and what can happen. So the risk is real. And, uh, you know, honestly, as a 34-year-old guy that played football for a long time, like, you're kind of, you're scared. You know, and, um, but at the same time, when you look at the state of where the NFL was in those years when those guys are now coming out and passing away and having issues, I look at other things. I look at, is there drug abuse and alcohol abuse? Because the reality is, is, is everybody in this room, whether you think you do or you not, you have CTE, believe it or not. It's not just like privy to football players. If you've done something, if you're a runner, if you're a soccer player, if you played sports, really in any way, just living, you have a form of this to varying degrees. Um, so it's, it's just part of it. But uh, So I look at the drug abuse, the alcohol abuse. I look at other factors that could have affected it. Clearly football is one of those. You know, for me, that's going to be the primary. Um, but yeah, the risk is real. And at the same point, you look at it and say, okay, am I willing to have that dream as a kid? and strive for the better part of my, really my whole life to get to this moment, have lived that moment out for 11 years. It's given me everything, including, including my wife and family. I wouldn't have met her without football. It's given me everything. How am I to sit there and look and say I wouldn't have done, it, I wouldn't have done the same thing again? I can't say that I, would, I would, would not do it. I think I would go through the same process. But I think if, the only way you can really take the risk away is by hitting less. And that's really the only thing you could possibly do unless you change some setup of the game. But um, it's a tough question. We wish you all had the answers for, I think. And I wouldn't be a kneeler to answer your other question. Chad? Chad, as a, uh, as a man who has lived the American dream, farm boy from South Dakota, I just, we just have to know your thoughts about uh, players kneeling at the national anthem. Yep. Um, I'll say this. I, will, I would never kneel for the, for the national anthem. So. But, but, also, but also, that's, and that's also saying that I would 100% link arms with my teammates. In this case, African-American teammates who I don't know the struggle. Because at the same time, just as I gave this conversation, this talk, the reality is, is we don't know everybody's struggle. Like, I was a white person from South Dakota, went to Iowa, came to Minnesota, and had two parents. I don't know what it's like to come from. I had college teammates, some of my best friends, come from South Florida in a really hard area to grow up. And they're great people. They're smart people. They're now successful people. And so as soon as I say I would never disrespect our country, our military that fought for all these freedoms we have, including my family, um, I would also not disrespect what they're doing because that's also part of this, right? And none of us, unless you've lived through that, can understand that. So to me, I would be linking up with those guys and say, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm in this with you guys and I'm supporting you. Because the reality is I have a ton of friends that I've met through football that have gone through stuff like this. Some of the stories I've heard from my teammates and situations they've been in, you just cannot believe what happens. And I'm not going to sit there and claim like I know every, everything, but, you know, everybody's entitled to their opinion, and that's the beautiful part about our country. In reality, is that's their right. And um, so, twofold. I wouldn't have knelt, I, don't, I wouldn't kneel, but I also wouldn't disrespect what they're doing, and I would be with them on that. So, you know, that to me is how I would do it. Everybody's got an opinion.
but so I know you're a big goal setter, so what's your next goal in life? Oh. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one. Because, so here's, I actually just um, was talking about this. And it's an exercise that my 10 year old just went through with her soccer team. And it was, what are your goals for when you leave high school in soccer? What are your goals for um, when you leave middle school? What are your goals for next year? And it's such a good exercise, and I've had to do this almost at every year in my professional sporting life and in college, to write down my goals. And if you're not writing down your goals, um, you should start. And so it's an exercise that we're starting now with our kids that I think is really good because they write down these goals that like, you know, my daughter wants to play for the US national team in soccer. And as a kid that grew up in a small town that played in the NFL, I'm not gonna tell her she can't. But at the same time, I'm gonna tell her how much work that's gonna take and if she's willing to put that in. Thankfully, she's got her mom's genetics, so she might make it. But, um, so my goal is to answer your question. I'm so trying to get on this question, but um, my goal right now is to be happy and content with where I'm at. And that's kind of wide reaching, but I've heard so many stories about players who leave the game and really struggle with the next phase of their life. And I like to think that I, because I kept everything kind of in front of me and kept my family the priority, that that will help lead me in the next thing. I don't know what I want to do next, but I don't feel like I have to be in a hurry to decide. So I'm trying to be as content and happy every day, and I have been, and I've enjoyed my decision, and I've lived with no regrets. So um, I guess I haven't written down my goals is the question. I guess the answer to the question. But that would be it. Okay, I have three questions. <laughs> what, okay. what, is, what is your second favorite football team? <laughs> this is an easy one. I got this one, guys. The Minnesota Vikings. Now, here's why. Because I like the Iowa Hawkeyes, number one. <laughs> so, Vikings. Go ahead. What's your and, second question? And who's your second favorite football player? Uh, so you're saying, do I think I'm the f number one? Is that what you think? <laughs> uh, like, I grew up, I'm going to blow your mind with this one because you don't know who this is, but I grew up a really big Ronnie Lott fan who played for the 49ers. He was a safety. Um, uh, my second favorite football player, like playing right now, somebody that you would know. Um, I'm going to say Eric Kendricks. You know who that is. I love Eric Kendricks and how he plays. Yes, that's, that's my answer. What's your third question? Did you forget? It was, who's your favorite football player when you were a kid? Oh, so I already answered that one. So I loved Ronnie Lott. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ronnie Lott was a safety for the 49ers. You guys don't follow football. Um, who just played just downhill and aggressive and loved to hit everything that moved and was just fun to watch. So, <laughs> Which actually was funny because, I'm sorry to cut you off, but <laughs> this is a good story. But so as a kid, I had this T-shirt with Ronnie Lott on it. And it was his neck all the way up to like the shirt top. And then it was like my head. <laughs> so, which was great. I mean, as a kid, you walk into school, you just think it's incredible, you know, and yeah, it was, that's the best. I wish I still had that one. What's, you have another question? You only had three, I thought. No. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Good job. Um, you sort of answered my question. I think with so many professional athletes, you're basically done with your career in your 30s, usually. So you, you said what you do, but do you think you and other professional athletes don't plan what, what they're going to do from the, you know, the other 50 years of their life? Yes, that's a challenge. Um, so, you know, the average life expectancy of the NFL, or life expectancy, career life expectancy, <laughs> we already answered that one with the CTE thing, but um, the average career length is about three and a half years if you went by average of everybody who plays in the NFL. And it's funny how we talked about the NFL being a business because the NFL has to start paying full benefits at four years. And we have a great, we have a great benefits program in the NFL. But it's funny that the average is three and a half, so just under that number. So they try to avoid paying, you know, it's like, you know, try to get out of everything. 
So I made it 11. I'm 34, fully retired. And the biggest challenge that a lot of us face is how do you plan your whole life financially in playing 11 years, in some cases five years or six years. Well, the reality is, is you have to have other skill sets. And that's why like, I was a huge proponent. I could have, after my junior year of college, I was getting a lot of phone calls about trying to leave college early, um, about being a draft pick. Um, I probably would have been a, a high pick that after my junior season as well, but you know, I made a commitment to the university and to my parents that I was gonna graduate. And you know, the first, basically the third play of my first preseason game, I tear my ACL. So what if that would have been a couple other ligaments and I never would have played again? You know, just you're one play away, you're one brief moment away from never playing the game again. And that's just reality, you know, in, in life, but it's, you know, in sport for sure. So I wanted to ensure myself that I could do other things. And one of the challenges I think a lot of kids face is they think they're going to come in and they think playing 10 years in the NFL is easy. They're going to make so much money, it won't matter. Um, but that's just not the case. And even now, like, you know, I played for 11 years, had, you know, had great success financially, but the question uh, I was just asked is, what's next? What are you going to do? You're just going to watch TV for the next 50 years. You know, there's no value in that. And that's just when bad things happen. So um, always challenging rookies. I've had a chance to talk to our rookie class for like the last seven years um, about just trying to continue to develop yourself in other ways. Um, they offer so many programs that doesn't get talked about a lot, but we offer so many programs to go back for continued education um, to get your master's, to be, become an entrepreneur, get your entrepreneurial slip, to um, go to all these great schools that we probably none of us are, should be able to get into because we play in the NFL, and it's such an advantage that way. And, and um, a lot of guys do take advantage of that, try to go back and continue their education. So then when they're done, um, they can become business owners. They can become whatever it is they want to do. And... Um, there are more positive stories out there than stories that are written, for sure. And a lot of times, only the negative stories, like a lot of our media, the negative stories get written. Um, but there's a lot of just really brilliant, bright NFL players that are doing some great things post-football. Um, but there's also some stories of guys that don't know what to do with their lives, and their marriage falls apart, and they don't know what to do without that fame and, and feeling of being in front of people. So it is a challenge. But um, I think, for me, the best part was is... is sort of I emptied the tank. You know, I just emptied the tank with my career and what I wanted out of it, and um, there's not that want or need to go get more. And that's just that feeling of, content and, and of contentment and not having any regrets is, to me, was really important to have that feeling. Why don't we do take uh, the fi one more question, it looks like, and this will be like, and if you could refrain from applauding wildly after this question, because I'm going to come and give him a present, and then you can applaud wildly, okay? <laughs> They already had that one covered with this, the stand-up. I thought you guys had to stretch, so you guys stand up for it. Uh, quick question. What was your degree at Iowa? Communications. So I had the benefit of, I had the benefit of being in front of the camera a lot just, uh, in, my, in school and studying. And then I, when I became a, a player, I actually played on the team, I got to travel around. They call it the I Club. I'm sure they guys have like the Gold Club here in Minnesota or the M Club, whatever you guys call it. And I got to get up as a 19-year-old you know, hack at speaking and give these chunked up speeches to donors saying we need money for the, you know, for our program. <laughs> and and uh, so needless to say, now that I'm doing this, sort of makes a lot of sense, I guess. Um, hopefully I've improved a little bit, but, but yeah, so communications, so. Cool. But don't Thank clap. you all for coming don't tonight. Clap. Don't Don't leave, don't leave, you stay up here. Um, thank you all for coming tonight on a beautiful fall day. We do, I didn't mention, by the way, we are aware that uh, Wyzetta High School has a football game tonight. Uh, we did not intentionally schedule this against that. Uh, it, we found out far too late to make the adjustments. So I'm guessing they have more people attending that game. Um, <laughs> maybe. They may have more people at the game. Anyway, so thanks for being here. I hope you'll come to the next one. And I'm really glad you were with us, Chad. We have a gift for you. This is a piece of granite um, that says, with thanks to Chad Greenway for bringing faith to life. We thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you very much.